Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Thriving Musician Podcast. Today, I have a very special guest in Corey Christiansen. I need to do that again. <laughs> Anson. Anson, <laughs> right? Okay. It's ballpark, man. Look, <laughs> it, 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 as many people as there are that know me, you get to say di- different ways. I'm fine with it. It's cool. <sighs> Corey Christiansen. There you go. So, That's perfect. We're not, I'm not even going to do it again. This is this is the episode. This is, yeah. No, <laughs> this I'm serious. Look, man, you're at least in the ballpark. Literally, when I started my career, I showed up to play one time in Iowa, and on the bill, they had me listed as Cornelius Christofferson. <laughs> Welcome to the Thriving Musician Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with musician, speaker, and consultant Spencer List to hear stories of how professional musicians navigated the inevitable financial challenges that arise on the path to creative freedom and get insight from industry professionals on how to break through to the next level of your finances, career, and art. Now, here's your host, Spencer List. So like, I mean, this was really early on, right? Before I had some records out, but I, but I had, I had driven like 12 hours or whatever to get to this gig. And I show up and on the marquee, it's like tonight only Cornelius Christopherson trio tonight only someone else. I'm like, who is this? Are we double booked? (laughs) And then I, and then I ran. So I went in and I'm like, hi, I'm uh, I, I'm Corey Christiansen. I think I'm playing here tonight, but you have Cornelius Christofferson on the marquee. They go, yeah, we couldn't remember who you were. So I'm like, oh, awesome. So like, thanks for the w- warm a, welcome. So all, so all my fans are going to be here, obviously, you know, it was totally, it was totally out. And, um, and then of course we played and, and, you know, they, you know, whatever, I don't know. They may have hated the music because I've never been back, but but it, but it was, it was bizarre. And that's the thing, man, that's the beautiful thing about going on the road. I've had like so many weird things I, you know, when I, when I started off doing a, do a, doing my education stuff, I used to go to around and do workshops. And I, I drove like 12 hours one time up into Iowa, Iowa to do a workshop. And I showed up and there's a big sign that said store closed for, you know, mandatory employee training. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm supposed to be doing a, a workshop here in two hours, you uh-huh. know? So I don't know, man. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, thriving, thriving musician, you know, aliases, <laughs> um, you oh, that's know, awesome. pl- playing at venues that are closed. Um, yeah, I've done it all. Awesome. I can't wait to get into all of that. So without, you know, without further ado or introduction, welcome to the podcast. So for just a, a quick introduction, um, Corey is an amazing guitarist. His father started teaching him at the age of five. He has his bachelor's and master's and he studied with legendary jazz guitar educator, Jack Peterson. I did. He is, he was for it looks like it's about seven years, the senior editor and guitar clinician, and clinician, excuse me, for Mel Bay P- Publications. Yeah, he's presented countless clinics and performances around the world, and he has a large fan base for his teaching and his playing. And from what I understand, you have is it two online teaching businesses? Is that correct? I do. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, two different platforms. So, and the for those of you who haven't already, I. His bio is in the show notes. You should look it up. It's very long, but I mean, it just goes to show all the things that he's done and who he's played with and opportunities and the traveling. And I mean, the list just goes on. And so I'm really looking forward to having conversation with Corey. We spoke over the phone and we actually met through Emily Merrill, which most of you hopefully have heard her episode, which was amazing. And we got to talking on the phone, Corey and I, and I think at least from my perspective, it was like an instant we're going to be friends (laughs) situation. And, you know, I think in the future we'll be doing some things together, but I I learned so much even just from him talking about his own story. And I'm really excited for you all to hear his story and some of the advice and, um, you know, mistakes and things that you can learn from. Um, So, but before we get into that, so for, for listeners who aren't familiar with you, can you give us a little bit more background, um, musically, financially, life? You know, what's brought you to this point? Oh, man. Well, 
I, I guess, you know, maybe where I should back up is that, um, or where I should start, you know, and people can look at my bio, you can see that I, you know, I got a degree in guitar performance at Utah State University to be mm -hmm. where, you know, I actually run the guitar program. Now I came back to my alma mater. And, okay. And, um, and we can talk about that too, but, um, and why I went that route, but, uh, yeah, I, um, you know, then I went and got a master's degree, uh, in at the university of South Florida in jazz performance. Um, and gal was, and then I stayed around another year. I was going to do a, a composition degree there also, cause Chuck Owen teaches there and, you know, Chuck, Chuck is an amazing composer and arranger, but, um, but I bailed the last semester. So I never did get that second master's degree cause uh -huh. I was, cause I was working, but, um, uh, you know, all that was, all those degrees were pretty cool. I mean, they allowed me later in my life to come back to academia, mm -hmm. which was, which was something that was kind of important to me, but, you know, I was, I was doing a bunch of, uh, studio work at the, you know, like in, when I was doing my master's degree and when I was outside of my master's degree and, um, uh, some of those studio sessions were for publishing companies. It was kind of weird. I was doing some stuff for Warner brothers. And then I ended up with it because of the connection of my dad doing some studio work for Mel Bay and they would fly me to St. Louis and I would do these recording sessions. And it was, it was not artistic at all. It wasn't like, Hey, let's do a cool art record. It was like, no, <laughs> we're going to do a CD for, you know, grade two, acoustic guitar you know so it's like we had all these kind of heavy cats and it's like do 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 you know and the thing is like those sessions are really hard because you can't screw up there's no artistic license at all right like it's like play the ink monkey yeah and so um so anyway i was doing a bunch of that stuff well it it ended up that i ended uh um i i went to lunch with bill bay of, um, you know, who's the president of Mel Bay Publications and one of the coolest people ever in the music business. I mean, just a true passion for guitar, a passion for music in general and a passion for music education. And anyway, we were at lunch and I remember where we were, we were at a steak and shake. I'm a real steak and shake junkie. <laughs> and, uh, and so we were at steak and shake and there I was having my Frisco melt with beans and slaw, chocolate malt. And he says to me, you know, everywhere I go to all these conventions and all these shows and, you know, just like everything I do, he said, people always come up to me and say, Hey, I got a great idea for a book. And he said, I always wonder, well, why would I, why would I publish that? But he said, when somebody walks up to me and they hand me a book, I say, huh, why wouldn't I put publish that? Okay, so to put this into context, this is like 1998, right? So the publishing industry is flourishing. It's not like it is now, you know, where everybody's self-publishing and everybody's putting their own stuff out online and, and people aren't really buying things anyway because, you know, everybody's giving it away for free on YouTube and 60-second clips on Instagram. And, and um, but so there was like, this was a real thing. But I'm not, you know, I'm not, the sharpest knife in the drawer all the time, but I'm not the dullest one either. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, I think this guy just told me how to get published. And I was just starting my second year of grad school. And my wife had a job that started at five 30 in the morning and we shared the car. So she dropped me off at school at 5 AM and I would just, and I would just practice, you know, till nine 30 or whatever my first class was. And then the way my schedule was, I was usually at school till about 10 PM, like in our car schedule was kind of weird. So so I was just, you know, I was on campus five days a week, or at least four days a week anyway, really long hours. And so I got thinking, I was like, I think this guy just told me how to get published. So I took a whole semester of those mornings. And in between my practicing, I was doing research and I started to write a book. And after a semester, I had 80 pages of concept down that it wasn't a brand new concept, but he didn't have anything like that in the Mel Bay catalog. So I just mailed it off to him and said, hey, you know, I wrote this book, you know, it might be something you're interested in. Boom, a week later in the mail, I, I got a contract. So I'm like, wow, this is amazing. I'm a grad student and I'm published by, you know, I'm going to be published by the biggest publisher of guitar music. And so uh, I thought it was cool. And then a few months, God, not even months later, weeks later, he writes me back. He's like, hey, I got an idea for a book that I need in the catalog. And I think you'd be good to write it. Do you want to do it? So I was like, I was like, yeah, cool. Of course. And then he wrote me back and he's like, I got another idea. So like, I'm, you know, I'm a grad student and I had three contracts 
and then I, uh, I, you know, I graduated or whatever, and I was doing some freelance work and still doing some of this studio work for him. But he wrote me a, um, or he called me actually, and he said, "Hey, I'm putting together this huge anthology of all these solos, you know, from different artists uh, that's going to come out." And, hey, and I was just wondering if you got time to transcribe like three of these solos. I need to get some of this stuff done. I was like, "Yeah, absolutely." So then a day later, he calls me back. He said, man, you know what I was thinking? I'm kind of embarrassed that I just asked you to transcribe. You should, have you got some music that we could put in and you could be included in this anthology? Now, here's wow. the thing. I had no business being put in that, in that anthology. Like Bill knew I could play, but I hadn't made a name for myself. Like I had no business. You know, I, I was transcribing, let's see, Jim Nichols, who's a great fingerstyle jazz player, John Abercrombie and Andy Summers. Those were the three guitars I was putting in. And so I'm in this, now he's asking me, hey, have you got some stuff to put in this book? And I'm like, geez, yes, I do. And I didn't. I didn't have anything. But what I did was, as soon as I said yes, I went and I recorded some stuff with some guys. And then I transcribed it. And I put it, you know, I, I sent him the, my transcriptions along with all those other guys. So, like, that's what got my foot in the door. Love it. So, um, you know, I had... Like I said, I'm not the sharpest academic, probably, but I'm pretty street smart. And so um, that's what I realized. I was like, yeah, I have no business being in this book, but it would be so stupid to say no. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, man, give me the ball. You know, I'll try and I'll try and get a few yards, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, so a couple months after that, he called me up and he's like, hey, I've, I put this job posting out there. I need somebody to come be my, you know, like my guitar editor, senior editor, whatever. Um, I've had a lot of people apply. Nobody's really fit the bill. And I keep thinking about you. Do you want to come take this job? And he's like, but hear me out first, because he's like, I know you're a player. And this is, this sounds like a jest job, but he's like, we built this company on my dad writing some good books. And then he drove all over the country with books in the back of his car. And he gave them to every guitar teacher in the United States. And then the teachers started using the books and that's how we made our money. Mm -hmm. And he's like, and I don't have anybody that's doing that right now for the company. So what I'm going to propose to you is that you can come be the senior editor and you can help with product development. And the way I want you to do that is I said, I want you to be in the office but I want you to go out on the road. And I want you to do workshops and I want you to get back to grassroots of knowing all the teachers and knowing all the players. And I want you to get our product in their hands, but I also want you to find out who's got the strongest curriculum and bring those back to us so that we can publish the best stuff. And he said, if you'll do that, he said, you can go out on the road and be a player six months out of the year, but you have to tie everything back to you know, this company somehow. Right. So he's like, I'll pay the flights. I'll pay the hotels. I'll play all the meals. If you will go out and be a touring musician. He just spawned you're sponsored now, basically. Dude, it's basically like I got the greatest jazz guitar endorsement that the history of the world has ever known. Yeah. Wow. And, and here's the thing, Spencer. I never had a budget at the beginning of the year or at the beginning of the month. I had like basically a credit card that had no bounds. Wow. And I could go do whatever I wanted as long as I cleared it with him first. Right. So I would plan out, you know, my, my schedule like six, six months in advance. Well, here's what I did. I was still, when I was in the office, I was still going in and like, do, 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 do. I was like doing those kind of recordings for yeah. the books, right? But we were also developing some pretty high-end stuff. But I used to hire some really, really great musicians to do those sessions with mm -hmm. me, yeah. right? And it was nuts, man. Like the guys that I, that I hired were all um, St. Louis top musicians. And at the time that was like, Emmanuel Harold, you know, who's now playing with Gregory Porter. And, you know, he moved to New York after some of this stuff and kind of made a name for himself up there. His brother, Keon Harold, who's, you know, all over the place, did one session with me where I needed trumpet, uh, had some great bass players. But so what I did is I, I was friends with the engineer. And so I told the engineer at every one of these little sessions where we were doing some play alongs, you know, those were mm -hmm. actually pretty fun, but you know, some of the simpler books that we had to put CDs, play along CDs with, 
I just told the engineer, I'm like, hey, for our sound check, like we're going to play like, you know, one or two standards. Will you just record them and then keep them? Yes. So after a year of doing those little sessions, I had like, I don't know, 14 or 15 tunes and I had enough stuff to release an album. Yeah. And it, co- and it cost me nothing. Wow. Because the musicians had been paid for their time. And so now I'm, I had my books that I was writing. I was being published. I was out on the road doing workshops and I was playing gigs because I knew a lot of the local musicians and I would just line up stuff, you know, and sometimes I'd show up as Cornelius Christine, you know, Christopherson or whatever. <laughs> but, but then I started to have a CD. Yeah. And then what happened was I told, so I was like, well, I'm going to give Bill a copy of the CD because I recorded some tunes that I knew that he liked. And I, so I gave him the CD. I said, Hey, look in the spirit of transparency. Like I did this recording and I explained the whole situation to him. So I'm like, technically, you know, like you kind of paid for this CD. So just let me know if I need to get straight with you, you know, on the bread or whatever. But yeah. he was like, he's like, cool, man, I'll check it out. So the next day he called me into his office and he's like, Hey, um, I listened to your CD and I was like, Oh, cool. You know, he, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, this isn't a bad meeting. He's not going to chew me out, but he might ask for some bread or whatever to go back into the company. Like, Hey, you know, you need to do this, but it kind of went the opposite. He was like, look, I was thinking about it. He's like, I know you kind of did this on a dime, but it's really good. And it, you know, now it's 2002 or whatever. Mm-hmm. And he's like, record labels are dropping their artists right and left because nobody's selling records, blah, blah, blah. He's like, this might be the perfect time for us to like start a record label and use, use the um, publishing company as the arm. And he's like, and we've got that, you know, he's like, we're already taking out ads in all the major magazines because the publishing company is a multi-million dollar company. Right. Mm -hmm. And he's like, but I think there's an opening here. And he's like, you know, blue note records, they were so focused, you know, you knew what you were getting when you got a blue note records in the sixties and the artwork was great. And he's like, I think if we did, an out or a record label with a really strong focus that it was tied to guitar, we could maybe be, you know, somewhat successful and it's going to promote the books. Right. So he was seeing like, he was a genius at how he was seeing this whole thing play out. Right. Yeah. So then he says to me, he goes, man, I was really impressed how you threw this together. So he goes, why don't we do this? You will be the first artist on the label hire whoever you want to be on your record, get whatever studio you want anywhere in the country. He's like, we'll do it right. We'll take out all the ads. We'll do, you know, like we'll make sure that we, cause we've got to promote this thing. And he's like, I think you'd be a good first artist. Here's the thing, Spencer, I have no business being the first artist on this label, just as I had no business being included in that book because I hadn't really done anything. Yeah. But the fact was I had paid some dues. I was playing pretty well. You know, I was playing with top tier guys. I just didn't have a real record contract. And that's what broke me open was, wow. was that right there. And then we went on to run, you know, that record label for several years. We had some number one records, um, you know, and I was, I was just kind of in with all the guitar guys, you know, and the thing was we were, we were always so straight with everybody on the bread and the contracts were always so good because Bill Bay is such, was really truly just such an honest businessman that had a passion for the music that, um, dude, it just, it just like catapulted my, you know, my career. And I was getting reviewed in downbeat and jazz times and jazz times would do articles on the record label. Well, I was the guy, you know, helping run the record label. Yeah. So it instantly just put me in this situation where I could kind of do whatever I wanted to do artistically. Wow. So I know that was really long winded. No, it's amazing. It's such a unique story, you know, in that most people don't, most people would have said no to the senior editor job because it's like, well, that's not going to, you know, I'm not being an artist, but like, I really saw that and I got some, some really great advice from, from people. And I've had some of my mentors back then that were like, Hey, do you remember when you got offered that job? I was like, yeah. And they're like, yeah, we told you don't take the job, right. It was going to ruin you. And I was like, yeah. And they're like, we're so glad you did not listen to us. (laughs) Yeah. Because they're like, look at, you know, where you've been able to take this. And, and here's the thing, Spencer, my whole life, I've had this attitude and I have three 
criteria that like every project I get involved with has to pass this, you know, these answers that are like these questions mm -hmm. with, with acceptable answers. And the first is very selfish. It's like, okay, what's in it for me? Mm -hmm. Like if I do this project, what's in it for me? But then the second question is, cause there's a lot of projects I can do that are just good for me. Mm -hmm. The second question is how many of my friends can I get involved in how many of my friends will benefit from this project? If like, if I go to the trouble of doing this, how many of my, you know, like brothers and sisters do I get to help with this project? Mm -hmm. right? And then the third is like, how many people will I be able to mentor in some way? Like how many students or how many listeners is this going to affect? Right. And so any project I get involved with, those are the three questions that are always on my mind. You know, what's in it for me? What's in it for my friends? And what's in it for everybody else? Yeah. And the Mel Bay gig was like a no brainer. I mean, it was awesome for me, but like, like, honestly, when we needed projects done, it was my Rolodex, you know, or my contacts list that, that we went to that's, that launched all of these, you know, all of these projects. So I got so many of my friends hooked up with publishing deals. Um, that it was awesome. I mean, wow. it was awesome. So before I, before I stop though, I have to tell you, so in 2007, I realized I can't go any further in the company. I'm only at, answering to the CEO. My last name's not Bay, so I'm never going to like take over the company. You know, it's mm -hmm. a family company. It's, I've turned it into probably the most prestigious job in the world for what it was. So what makes a ton of sense? Quit your job without a plan and go do something else, right? Which is what I did. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because, because um, um, I, I really I didn't know what I was going to do, but I just knew that I couldn't go any further and I, and I just knew that I had to do, I, I just had to take out the safety net yeah, and do something else, you know, to achieve my artistic goals. And, um, the, you know, financially what somebody might say, that was a really stupid thing to do, but it hasn't been. And so I did, I quit my, I quit my job and, um, I don't want to say I panicked because I didn't panic because here's the thing, Spencer, we spent as artists, we spent our whole life learning how to be creative and that skill set set should carry over into every aspect of our career. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing I always said is like, you know, I've, I never was the guy that like moved to New York and got mentored by Art Blakey or insert one of a hundred other really influential jazz artists. Right. Mm -hmm. But what I did is I went and got gigs and I hired all the people that were older than me to mentor me. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I did. And, and that was a creative way, I think, to, you know, get my career going to where it wanted to go. And I was on the road all the time. And part of the reason I said that is, you know, should, should throw this out that I had a five-year-old, four-year-old son at the time. And he, commented one time as the taxi was taking me off and I'd only been home one day in between trips. And my wife said that my son said, mom, it's so fun when dad comes to visit. Oof. You know? Yeah, exactly. Right. So I was like, Oh man, okay. Maybe I got to reevaluate like what I'm actually doing here. And so I wanted to get back into to academia and that was kind of a tricky, that was kind of a tricky thing for, you know, for me for a long time to do. Also, I was teaching at Utah State as a visiting professor. I was teaching at Indiana University as a visiting professor. And if you look at a map of the United States, those are not really, <laughs> you know, like adjoining zip codes, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so that was, you know, that was kind of a, you know, it was a great experience, but I, but it was a trying time that I went through and, and suffered for the music and for music education mm -hmm. and long story short or, or long story, even longer <laughs> is that like, I, I had this, um, panache, I guess, for, for being able to see how things were going to go with music technology and education. And so I, I really got into like online learning platforms and, um, I started a company with a friend of mine called Staline that was like live one to infinite user interface. Mm -hmm. And I could also build a course 
uh, on that content. So I started stockpiling content by doing live master classes with guitar players all over the world. And uh, that company ended up kind of morphing. I ended up taking my content over to a company that I'm with now called musiclessons.com, which I don't own, but I do have stock in okay. uh, as a founding member. And so I have that company. But then that experience led to a guy who has an online accredited high school coming to me. And long story short again, I've, I've helped them build 24 music courses that now we can uh, sell anywhere, pretty much anywhere in the United States that high school students can get fine arts or elective credit towards graduation by studying an instrument on a private level. Wow. And nobody's ever done that before. So this, this company is like, boom, like it's yeah. going to be massive. That one's called educational advantage. Awesome. So I have um, stuff uh, with musiclessons.com, which is like my jazz content, jazz guitar. And then I have, um, I, I serve as the curricular uh, curriculum director for educational advantages, music arm. Okay. And then I do the, you know, the Mel Bay thing. And, or, I mean, I still have, you know, the, the books with Mel Bay, but I do the Utah state thing full time. I, I'm the director of that program now, um, tenured faculty member at Utah state now. And, um, and then I record for origin records out of Seattle and I still tour and, and I play festivals and, and, um, and I do all that stuff. So, I know that was really crazy long. I have to, I almost apologize to your listeners. Cause that's, I mean, that really was like a marathon. Not at all. Of where I started and now where I am now, you know, as far as the umbrellas, I haven't talked about any particulars, but I've really laid out like, okay, this is the bigger view of, of my career. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, there's so much to just for people, for listeners to even imagine some things that are possible how did these things come about? And I mean, I'm hearing resourcefulness. You were open to opportunities. You were creative with how you managed them. It, it's it's a fascinating journey that you've been on. You know, part of it too, I should throw this out because you'll appreciate this with what I know the scope of, you know, like your podcast is, I mm-hmm. think, and, you know, who you are as a, as a person and an advocate for uh, musician financial security and literacy. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which the literacy will lead to the, you know, security. Mm-hmm. But one thing that I decided when I was really young, and I remember this, I was like, I was walking in to play a country club and I was doing like most musicians do. And I was walking in through the kitchen. Right. And you know how sometimes that can feel like you're a third class citizen, you know, yeah. doing that. And I said to myself, I will never, play a country club that I cannot join as a member, you know, and, and that's, that's kind of shallow actually, and kind of maybe even a little bit icky, but what it was in my head was that mentally, if I go play a country club and I come through the kitchen, here's going to be the reason why, because I want to hang out with my friends and the music's going to be great, but I'm mentally not ever going to let myself be in a place where those people I'm playing for are above me. Yeah. Right. And, and I'm going to figure out a way to make this music um, not second class. Yeah. You know, and, um, and your life. And, yeah. And I wanted my, you know, I want my wife and my kids to have a certain standard of living. And look, man, I'm a musician. Like, <laughs> you know, like all I need is a little bit of gear money because I like, you know, like, <laughs> a roof over my head, some good meals, maybe a little affection would be cool. Mm -hmm. But like, like at the end of the day, like when you're hardwired, like a musician, like the things that really matter are the music and the projects. Well, I'm just, you know, I'm finishing up a, um, you know, like the mixing on, on one of my new records. And the fact is I have to have money to do those projects. Yeah. The reason I want financial security, you know, isn't necessarily so I can, acquire more things i want to have financial security so i can better express myself as an artist yeah that's very well said um i want to talk a little bit it's cool that you had like a moment and i think a lot of musicians have moments like this um maybe they're at a gig maybe they're at a jam session or they're at a rehearsal and i i mean i've had many moments where 
my thoughts are like, what am, why am I even here? What am I doing in this room right now? What's really happening? Right. Who am I surrounded by? What kind of music am I playing? Am I getting paid this much or that much? Am I, I'm, I mean, you know, sometimes you get fed, sometimes you don't. And, or I, I've said this before on a podcast, like I've been caught at a gig outside and it's 32 degrees <laughs> and I'm standing there like, what is my life? What am what am I doing here? Who right. who decides to yeah. do this? Yeah, and here's the thing: you can actually decide to do that and have fun with that if you don't have to do it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a, a difference point. between do I have to play in 32 degrees or do I get to play in 32 degrees with my friends? Because we all think this is ridiculous and we're laughing. Yeah, right. It's a big difference, right? I mean, look, I got some friends that play up in Jackson. And they do this thing called Tram Jam. And they might hold the world record for the coldest gig ever. I think the last, I think two years ago, they played at the bottom of the tram. And it was like 32 below zero. And, they, and they're like, they're like, we've got a gig. They called me. One of the guys called me. My friend Jeff called me. You might want to come up and do this. And I thought about it. I was like, it's a five-hour drive. I think I want to do this. Like, I want to go play you know, brown sugar at the bottom of the tram in minus 32 degrees, just to say I did it, <laughs> right? Like, I don't need the money. Yeah, that's funny. And they don't need the money either. They just do it because it's like, they're crazy. They're just crazy <laughs> guys, right? And they found other ways, like they're making money doing other stuff. So they just do this thing kind of for fun. Yeah. But, but you know, I, I have chosen to make m- music my income. And so what that means is in this current environment, we have to be creative about how we present ourselves as two things, an artist and as an entrepreneur. Right. And, you know, it, I mean, you can, you can look at models all throughout the world, but it's like, yes, McDonald's came up with a really great logo right? But there are other fast food joints that were very creative about how they presented, you know, their, their offering. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I know, uh, you know, like, let's say Chick-fil-A, I know it's kind of a controversial company in some ways, but the fact is that whole thing about like, we're just doing chicken because everybody else does beef and chicken. Like that was kind of smart, right? And it was a creative way to launch another franchise. Well, You know, when I look at myself, you know, Spencer, I I really am forced to look at every aspect of my of my career. The most important thing to me is is learning how to control sound and vibrations. And that's really what we do as art, you know, as as musical creators. Mm -hmm. We're controlling sound. Okay. But then there's all these other aspects of of that as a business that can become very fun. And it's, it's like, it's puzzle solving, right? Like if you like to solve puzzles, man, be, be a professional artist because Mm -hmm. you've got puzzles for the rest of your life. (laughs) And, um, and I was, you know, the guy or the generation that came up where my first two records were under the old model where you had a record label that did everything for you and, you know, gave you a nice budget and then, you know, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. And, and then when that model changed to you no know, art music is not going to be funded the same way. It's going to be more of a like responsibility on the artist. A lot of older musicians were, and frankly still are very jaded that they yeah. have to do that. Like, well, you know, take care of the music and the music will take care of you. And you're like, yes, that was awesome. In 1963. <laughs> yeah. Like, and that's the truth, you know, because yeah. like back then, not everybody could play, but now everybody can play. Oh yeah. Oh, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, like, like what there is not a dearth of as people that can play giant steps. And, and so you know, like the litmus test or whatever for being successful is, has kind of, um, or the barometer or whatever has really changed to, yeah. you have to assume everybody's super bad because they are. And now what am I going to do that's as creative as my music with my career? 
And it has everything to do with your zip code. It has everything to do with your personality. Some people are introverted. Some people are extroverted. Mm -hmm. It has everything to do with, you know, how comfortable you might be, you know, around other people. Mm -hmm. Uh, There's all these things that go into place. And, you know, and I spend a lot of time like mentoring, you know, I do these these things where I get together and mentor people or they pay me to mentor them or whatever, Mm -hmm. but into like, let's figure out like, what kind of person are you? Like, because first of all, what makes you happy? Okay. Then let's like turn that into what, what can, you know, what can make you, you know, financially secure so that you can do even more of the stuff that makes you happy. Yeah. And I don't know if you've noticed in this interview, but I'm, I'm an extrovert, right? So like, there are things that being an extrovert, you know, allows me to do and remain happy where, right. where some of this stuff would be like, people would be like, Oh man, that's my worst nightmare. Right. You know what I mean? And, yeah. and like, that's okay. Like the way I did it, isn't the only way to do this business. Yeah. There are so many other ways. And actually, you know, I know a lot of people get dark on, you know, music school or music business. And, and I'm like, no, I'm more optimistic right now than I ever have been for my students. Because if you are creative and you're an entrepreneur, you are going to figure out ways to be, you know, really, really fantastic at what you do Mm -hmm. and like have fun turning that into, you know, like a revenue stream. And you can use that to either go on a vacation or do a record. And there's not a right answer to that. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's just not. So, I mean, well, there is a right answer. It's both. Like you make enough money to do both, but, but, but anyway, I mean, I could go, I could go on and on. No, this is, this is wonderful. And I have so many questions. It, it, it gets to the point where I have a question I'm ready to ask and then I lose it because I have others that, <laughs> that come into play. So you mentioned zip codes. So let's just go into that really quickly. Yeah. Um, people like, you know, and I really like that you say, you know, this, everyone's path is totally unique to you. So if you're listening, I mean, you have a unique path and maybe no one has ever gone down it. I mean, Corey's story is completely unique. Like, I don't think I've ever heard anyone has had a path like that. And that's going to be yours too. And so there might not be a cookie cutter, you know, trail for you. Well, you have to decide that you want a unique path. Yeah. And then you have to have the courage to follow that path. Not knowing. I'll tell you you what, man, it is a pretty lonely, you know, walk through the forest with your machete when you're carving your own path. Well, I can relate. Being a professional musician, I started then, I started learning about marketing. Uh And then now I'm doing, I'm learning about finance and teaching musicians financial literacy. Right. I mean, talk about, I don't know anybody who has had the path that I've had. And right. that is not a brag at all. It is nope. lonely. It is difficult. And what you said, like, I'm just going through a jungle with machete hoping to, like, <laughs> yeah, you know, exactly. find water <laughs> like, right. or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the thing is, man, it's the guy with the machete that goes through the forest that like finds the lost city of gold. Right. (laughs) Right. Right. I mean, you know, now I'm turning your podcast into like a choose your own adventure book, (laughs) but, but like, that's totally what this business is. Look, man, here's the thing. I, and I've thought about this a lot. You know, I see friends of mine that are like, Oh, I'm going to business school and I got an MBA and I'm going to go work for bam as an A level exec. And then five years later, they're like, yeah, what happened when your company went bankrupt? Yeah. You know, or they have this major, like they get fired and then it's like, Oh, I'm devastated because I'm fired. I'm like, really? Cause I've been fired like 20 times, <laughs> you know, like as a musician, like, get, like, you just have such a thick skin. Like, we are such great entrepreneurs, you know? And and believe me, the, you know, the guy that's, like, you know, doing my taxes or whatever has not had near the criticism about their personal existence that I have because, like, everything we do artistic is putting, it like, ourselves out there on the sleeve, you know, for some guy to be like, yeah, I really don't like the mix, you know, or whatever, <laughs> yeah. you know, or, uh I don't think your compositions are really going anywhere. And, you know, and it's like, man, that's my personality you're talking about. What you just said was your personality isn't really going anywhere. Yeah. And, and like, we learn to be okay with that and laugh about it. 
you know, I'll be like, yeah, well, whatever, you know, I, I, he's probably right. You know, maybe, I, <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe my compositions don't go anywhere. Yeah. And, um, and then we come back swinging. So we're like, musicians are like form of formidable opponents, man, when it comes to the business world. Right. I mean, yeah. we have all this, this skill set to go, but it does. I mean, you'd mentioned the, you know, like the, the zip code. I mean, where you live does have something to do with your career, unless you've got your career into a situation where, you know, like, like, you know, uh, frankly speaking, mine was at a place where it didn't matter where I lived. Cause I wasn't playing in St. Louis at all. Really. I was playing at the end of my time there. I was on the road six months out of the year. Yeah. And so it was kind of like, I think I can actually maintain this, but that means I can live wherever I want to live. So I like to fly fish. So I moved back to Utah, you know, to this valley I grew up in when there's a bunch of really great trout, trout streams and I'm 90 minutes from the airport and everybody says, oh my gosh, you're so far from the airport. I'm like, have you ever been to LA? The airport is eight miles away and it's 90 minutes. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter. The difference is I just drove through a whole bunch of beautiful country for 90 minutes, Yeah, you know, and saw some stuff on the way to the airport. And I took care of some business calls and I worked in my car while I was driving. And that's no different than it taking 90 minutes for me to get from my house, 20 miles from the airport in St. Louis. And it was 90 minutes in rush hour. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So at the end of the day, I was like, well, I'm just going to go live wherever I want to live. And, and then I had to start to construct a career around that zip code, you know, because mm -hmm. it's like, well, yeah, I'm on the road a lot, but still, I, okay, I need some teaching opportunities because I like doing that. Okay, how am I going to make that work? Oh, well, there's a university. Okay, well, maybe I can get in with them. But I'll tell you, one of the cr most creative things I did was I started this thing called Weekend at Corey's, you know, which is my friends kind of called it that and it just stuck, you know, it's like Weekend at Bernie's or whatever. Yeah. But, yeah, but I was fly fishing with my son when he was five years old, six years old, maybe. And I used to put him on my shoulders and I would take him up the river to places where his mother would have killed me if she would have seen what I was doing with this kid. <laughs> but I'd fly fish and I'd hand him the rod, right? Like I get a fish on, I hand him on the rod. He's on my shoulders. And it was this thing that we just, that we just did every week. And, and it was a really great time. But one day we were sitting on the bank of the river and he's like, my son had this epiphany. He's like, dad, when we get old, we should figure out a way that people will pay us money to fish. And I was like, let's do it right now. <laughs> so I started thinking about it. And I was like, you know, I live in this amazing area and I'm pretty good at getting fish on the line. I'm like, I bet I could do this thing where like people would fly out to study guitar with me in the mornings and then I'll take them fly fishing at night. Amazing. And so, you know, I built a house that had a guest room in it. It was private. And then I put some feelers out to all these people I'd met during my Mel Bay tours. And I knew a bunch of guys that were like CEOs and trust fund people and managing trust funds or managing hedge funds, uh, owned companies, A-level execs, guys that had money that played guitar and they play it pretty well. But I just re reached out to him. I said, hey, I'm leaving five weeks open every summer, weekends. You know, if you want to come in, you fly in on Wednesday. We do guitar Thursday, Friday, Saturday. You fly out Sunday morning. We do guitar from nine to noon. My wife's a gourmet chef, which is totally true. You'll get three squares a day. And then, like, when our brain is full of music, we'll go hit the river. We'll fly fish. Or I'll take you golfing. Or we'll go hiking. Like, we'll do some kind of zip code, you know, themed. Yeah. Adventure. And while we're doing that adventure, guess what we're talking about? We're talking about music, you know? Yeah. It's brilliant. And so these guys were getting, you know, and I've had college students come do it. They get more out of it, like the 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 hang time than even sit down in the room playing, right? You yeah. learn more oh, when yeah. you're hanging out with your mentors than you do like sitting there in a lesson. Yeah. And and like, you know, Spencer, I booked out the whole year, like in a week of phone calls. It's crazy. And and so now I do this thing every year where like I, you know, like basically mentor people and uh, hang out with my friends. And like my son said, I figured out a way to get paid to fly fish. Yeah. There's really no limit to this stuff. There, yeah. And that's, you hit it. There's no limit. Like the only limit is, is like what you're going to limit yourself to thinking. 
yeah. and then not being overwhelmed with life and, and, and losing track of like what your goals actually are. Yeah. Wow. Cause I still go in through the kitchen sometimes to play gigs, you know, like I just do, like I yeah. just go in through the kitchen, you know, but, but, it, but I'm always like, Hey, I don't need the money from this gig. I'm going so I can hang out with some of these guys and remind myself of where my roots were yeah. and play some good music and have a good time and maybe get a meal with the guys after. And then we'll yak it up and it's going to be a fun hang. And then I'll go home. And basically all I did is earn enough money to keep me in fishing gear for the week. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I have these other things going on yeah. that are my foundation so that I can choose to do those things. Right. What do you say to you know, I've heard this a lot from people and I remember growing up kind of just kind of hearing this a lot and maybe feeling it a little bit, but you know, what do you say to someone who says, you know, I, I, I do music because I love it. Um, and I don't care if I'm starving or poor, it doesn't matter. As long as I'm playing music, I'm happy. What, what do you think when you hear that? Well, I would just, I mean, I think it's valid. You know, I'm like, if that's, if that's what brings you the most happiness, then, then that's great. But I would follow it up with another question. If you could have that and financial security, would financial security make you unhappy? Right. And I mean, because here's the thing. I w- okay, so I was walking, I was with one of my friends, I was on tour and I was staying with a friend that's been financially successful in a really nice neighborhood. And we were walking down there. There were some homes, two, two or three homes that were being built on this lake that were really beautiful. And he lives a little further up the hill on the lake. And, mm-hmm. and I was with another musician, right? We were, we were kind of staying in this guy's basement while we were playing. And my friend said, these were massive houses that were going up or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so obviously the people had some bread, but um, they said to me, yeah, but are they really happy? And I said, you know what? I said, uh, I don't think we can answer that question, but the premise of the question is flawed because I'm going to ask you this one back. Are they really unhappy? Like that house doesn't make you unhappy, you know, and it could be, okay, maybe they've worked so much that, you know, uh, at a job they don't like that they're building this to like compensate for something. I don't know. Right. But, but what I see when I see that is I say, I don't know. I think they're probably kind of happy because to be good at anything, or I should see to be good enough at anything to afford that kind of lifestyle, you must be passionate about what you do because you got good at it. Right. So I'm going to say, I don't think we can, can answer the question or even ask it honestly. Yeah just based on the size of somebody's construction plot. Right. 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 Yeah. So, so when people say, well, I don't, all I need is this to be happy. I'd say, well, I think that what you've done is you've introduced some kind of measure to give yourself an out for being a failure. Justification of sorts. There you go. Yeah. That's probably the word I'm looking for. You've given yourself a justification, but I say, to that i say look it's valid if all you need is the music to be happy then that's great but the follow up question is would financial security actually make you more unhappy so if you could do all the things that you're doing now that bring you happiness but then have financial security and i'm even going to say in my life financial security is not my priority mhm it just isn't. It's just that I re- the music is my priority. Mm-hmm. But what I realized is there was a way to have the cake, which was the music, and to enjoy it even more by eating it, yeah. which was the financial security. And so as a result of that, yes, I've been able to put out eight albums under my own name as a leader that I've paid, well, six of them I've paid for, mm-hmm. right? through different, you know, means or or whatever. Yeah. And then I have a hundred percent control over my art. Hundred percent control. Yeah. And all the choices you make, I mean, from here on out, if you want to do a gig or not. I mean, that I talk about that a lot is, you know, if you can find the financial security, you then have the power and choice to 
to do what you want to do. And if, and if that's make more art, then all the better. Right. Right. And I'm not even sure that having money, like, I'm not saying that having money makes you more creative. It doesn't. I got a very, I got in a pretty serious debate with a, with a friend of mine the other day um, about, you know, his premise was that the, or or side of the argument was that innovation, the only reason innovation exists is because of the free market. And I don't agree with that. I think that the human spirit will continue to innovate regardless of what type of, you know, trade model right. you know, our world subscribes to, right? Yeah. Whether it's, you know, free trade or control trade or no trade or, or whatever. Yeah. The human mind is fundamentally designed, and this is, you know, this is my belief, with a godlike characteristic, which is to create, Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's one of the things that I just think that we get as humans is we get this little thing that's like, wow, we have a mind that allows us to create. That's the leaky faucet, man, that you can never turn off. It doesn't matter what's going on around you with, you know, free trade or, or whatever. That doesn't matter. We are designed to be creators. And so we have to exist in a world where there's some money that, you know, that like needs to exist. In other words, we can't take care of this capsule, our body that like, and our mind, right. that's going to take us through this experience. And that's just, that is the scenario where, that we're in. And it might not always be like that. Maybe there'll be a day where money will go away. I don't know, mm-hmm. but we exist in that world right now. So it's like, here are the rules. Let's learn the rules. And then let's play the game the way we want to play the game. But there are some rules that we have to adhere to. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And let's be real about it. And right. You know, we don't have to have those, the fantasies about what's right and what's wrong and how we do things, whether that's with money or with music. Um, So for a listener who has maybe heard a few episodes or they're really deep into this stuff and, you know, we're, you know, I try to educate about savings, retirement, taxes, income, insurance, you know, just kind of the right. basics of yeah. financial planning. This is kind of a hard, hard question, but, you know, maybe either your experience with this or what you would recommend to somebody who is trying to get these things in order, learn more about them, take action, put them into action in their life, but also balance that, like you just kind of talked about, you know, keeping music as the focus, but still getting this financial literacy as they're learning from me or from whoever. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, okay. Here's the thing. If you want to get better at being okay, like our genre, right? You want to be better at uh, being a jazz musician or whatever, just insert whatever art you want here. Mm-hmm. Let's just talk to all artists for a minute. Okay. So I want to be better at my art. What do you do? you go and you find some mentors that help you become better at your art, right? Mm-hmm. You surround yourselves with yourself with better artists, right? I mean, I just did that. I, my, my record that I'm getting ready to release here in a few months is all like Afro Cuban based music. Right. But there's no piano and there's no horns, which is wow. like, you know, so <laughs> it's, so it's like a guitar based record of Afro Cuban influenced music and then like cool. well and i hired some of the best guys on the planet and i just got destroyed you know <laughs> like which is exactly what i wanted to happen because yeah. i got better yeah you know in the week that we spent together doing concerts and up and it led up to like i got better at understanding their vocabulary their language right so um and i had done a ton of listening on my own for you know a long time but at the end of the day, like I needed to be in their presence and I needed to experience a thing. So I don't think it's any, there's anything that's any different. Like if you want to get better at financial security, then, then you got to hang out with some accountants, right? You got to hang out. And I got this advice from a friend of mine in Detroit that like really is a great, you know, businessman um, that has had music as, as his um, and music education as his, um, you know, entrepreneurial platform Mm -hmm. but he's hugely successful i mean hugely successful financially and um and this was the advice he gave me he's like man you want to learn about you know like tax a lot then you got to hang out with lawyers right if you want to get good at 
racquetball, you have to hang out with guys that are good at racquetball. So if you want to get good at financial stability, you got to hang out with people who are good at, at, at being financially stable. Yeah. And then you learn and you take notes and you get better the same way you get better at music. Yeah, I agree. And I want to add to that getting better at financial security or racquetball or whatever doesn't have to take away from your music. So I, oh, I remember not. thinking that and, and even growing up when music started to take over, I kind of like cl- closed the door on other things that I was good at or I really enjoyed. And so I, I like to emphasize that by learning about these things, they don't, and you, you mentioned this earlier, that that's not even your focus. You know, it doesn't have to be your number one priority. Um, and it won't make you any less of a musician and right. it, it can make you more of a musician, just giving you more opportunity to play more or to, yes, it does. to record more, to teach more, whatever you want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, that's very helpful. Well, it allows you, it allows you to say no, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it allows you to say no to things. And that's a great power that a lot of musicians underestimate is that like, I have the power to say no to certain things if it's not going to make me happy. Yeah. And you have to work for that. You have to work for that, you know, blessing in your life to be able to like turn things down and say no. Yeah, that's a tough one. I remember, and I say this a lot too, is, you know, when you're first starting out, you kind of, you say yes to everything you want to totally. just be everywhere. Right. But yeah. I remember growing up and, you know, I never, I never thought that really the goal is to get to a point where you're saying no, almost all the time because that's where I'm at now um, for multiple reasons beyond music. But um, it's kind of an interesting path to go on thinking that that is sort of a goal is to get to a place where you can say no and feel good about it and not feel right. like, Oh man, how am I going to pay my rent? You know? Well, and just to say no, that like, no, this is not, I'm not going to do this because this saying yes to this thing is going to take me away from what's actually more important. Yeah. And that fluctuates. Yeah. You know, like it was important for me to get back to spending more time with my kids. You know, when my son said, Oh dad, it's nice when you come to visit. (laughs) But like I had, like, I couldn't just change that. Like he said that on a Monday, I didn't just fix that on a Tuesday. Yeah. Right. It was like, okay, now I've got a goal to get myself into a career, like get my career and start thinking about it strategically in a way. Now, look, my path is not everybody else's path. You know, my path really was, I'm going to be a very strong player so that I can take more high profile gigs that pay more money per hour. And I have to do less of them because the fact is when you go on the road and you play a festival, you generally, not always, but generally will make more than you're going to make playing a local gig when it comes to art music. Now, Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that you can't get some really high paying, you know, cover band stuff or whatever. Certainly. But art music, you cannot be from your own zip code. Nobody wants to hear my stuff in my neighborhood. They're like, how can you be a good guitar player? You don't even mow your lawn every week. You know, I mean, it comes back to that that thing of like, you know, profit in his own country. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that, and that's a real thing, you know, like, uh, why do we want to go down, you know, and hear Corey play on main street, you know, he's booked out a venue and blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, he's my neighbor, you know, and like he forgets to take the trash cans in. <laughs> I- how could he, how could he possibly be good at anything? Cause he's not good at taking in the trash cans. <laughs> That's an actually really important concept, I think, because even on a serious note, I mean, I think about like in Dallas or probably in any city, it's like, oh, this person's playing here and he lives there and then they're going to play at that place again the next week or the next month. And I wonder why people don't come. And, and, you know, there's there's differences here with like trying to build a local fan base and all that stuff. But this is an important topic to consider. Um. I mean, that it's, you know, come through is what everyone says, come out to my show. And yeah, it's, well, look, it's the intrigue. And the thing is, it goes very, very deep because it's not just, um, it's not just performances either. It's also teaching. You know, you think about like, 
um, how students become very complacent about, you know, and very familiar and a little bit um, uh, comfortable with who they go study with. You know, you went to UNT, right? Yes. I mean, it's like, man, you studied with the best people in the world. I mean, you know, and, and what happens is, is it, it's like there becomes a familiarity and you kind of forget that. Like yeah. that just happens. It's, it, it, it it's, it, I'm not even sure that it's, you know, necessarily I'm going to say it's a bad thing. It's just what happens. I mean, I have my students here that I can tell, I can almost tell like click when it happens that they go, Oh yeah. Corey's Corey's the guy that teaches here versus Corey's the guy that has done this and 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 this. And that's just what happens. Yeah. So, you know, as an artist or as a lecturer or as a, you know, famous scientist or whatever, you're always going to have more positive reception when you are not talking to your neighbors. Because yeah. again, it's like, how can that guy know how dna works because he doesn't even bring in the trash cans yeah yeah i mean i've, I've seen him drive <laughs> he's a horrible driver and and people how kind can of... he cure cancer there's <laughs> no way this man could cure cancer people... i brother i can't believe that he can even feed himself <laughs> yeah i mean think about like your friends who know you as a really closely and you know, for people who know me and, and what you're saying resonates with me times infinity. You know, people have known me as a saxophonist, woodwind specialist, you know, low reeds. I like to play Barry and bass clarinet and all this cool. stuff. And I, I I'm really like to sight read and all that kind of stuff. And that's great. But that's an identity, right? So it's easy for your neighbors and whether that's your friends or your music community, mm -hmm. um, anybody in your area, your family you are now that identity. And so here these years have passed on and I am and have always been so much more than that identity, but now I'm really showing that. So if I go speak, like when I spoke at Jen, I'm talking to mostly strangers and I did have some friends from school come out, which was really nice. Mm -hmm. um, those strangers are looking at me as a brand new, there's no identity attachment from I, years of hanging out no, with I, me or knowing me. Totally. Totally. Oh, I'm going to, okay. Cause we are both at the same gen convention, right? Mm -hmm. And our, and our, like we didn't connect at, at gen, yeah. but, but I'm going to tell you, it's interesting that you say this because, and that we're on this topic because I had uh, a musician come up to me uh, that I'm friends with, like in my local scene, mm -hmm. okay. That I'm friends with at gen and said, yeah, I saw that you were doing a workshop but whenever I see my friends are doing a workshop, I don't go to that workshop. I go to somebody else's because I figure I'll just see you like, you know, on the weekend and we can talk. <laughs> and, and I'll get it. And this was the thing. And I'll get it from you later. But I need to take advantage of all, being around all these other people right now. Okay. Wow. So, so first of all, I'm like, well, I can see your logic. But then I'm going to tell you this. I think that is jank. Because like what you, sh sh what we should be doing is trying to support our friends, right? Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, the fact is, no, you won't get this from me at our gig. Yeah. I'm going to talk to you about developing a business plan at our gig. I'm here to play some music and eat that shrimp cocktail. <laughs> yeah. You know, and like, we're going to talk about music. Like, no, I'm not going to give this to, like, that's jive yeah you know and 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 i try to make sure that i go to support my friends in those kinds of things but it's the same thing with the gigs and it's just like as an artist you just really have to develop this you know this skin or whatever it is to, to just understand and not be offended that like for example right now i'm in the middle of doing this record and i am running a crowdsourced indiegogo campaign to pay for it mm -hmm. and i've been successful with two of those and i have very very like strong devout followers that listen to my music and and i'm very thankful for what they've done to support me mm -hmm. but in my own area my kid 
could start an Indiegogo campaign to get a new pet snake, and he would probably do better with my immediate friends than I would trying to raise money for, for a record, right. you know? Right. And you just have to come to terms with that. Yeah. That it's like, that's just kind of how it is. Look, Girl Scout cookies are going to crush your Indiegogo campaign. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and so, so you do, you have to, th- I think to be successful, you really have to think about who am I, who am I? Marketing? Now, and I should say this though, I know some people who are geniuses at developing a local following mm-hmm. and that is going to be their, that's going to be their, their audience. That's their tribe. Yeah. It hasn't really worked out for me for some reason. I don't feel yeah. the same kind of support, you know, like I'll, I'll rent a room in my town, like Logan, Utah, and I'll bring in a really great trio and maybe an outside outside guest to try and get 40 people into this intimate listening, you know, um, Mm -hmm. environment. And I'm sweating bullets at the end, like before every show, because it's like, oh man, we haven't pre-sold any tickets and, you know, 40 people, you know, like 40, really 40 people, but 40 (laughs) people in my zip code is a huge accomplishment Mm -hmm. on a Thursday night. And that's wacko. Do you know what I mean? Because like, like that's strange that, that like you can't do better in your own town than I could in like Ames, Iowa, (laughs) (laughs) you know? And I, and I don't mean to say Ames, Iowa with disgust in my voice. Like I did, it wasn't towards the town. I actually really like Ames, Iowa. Uh The the thing is the disgust is that I have to travel 2,200 miles to get like to get more than 40 people to show up. Right. And, and when I play for my peeps in my own zip code, I'm the one that rented the room. So I'm out 250 bucks there. And then I got to pay all the musicians. So there's another 300 or whatever that I'm out and they're doing me a solid at even doing it at that price. Right. Right. Cause, Cause it's, it's going to be fun. So it's like, and then I'm out there stressing about selling 40, $20 tickets <laughs> to actually pay the band more than I promised them, which I usually try to do Uh and cover the room, you know, and all this stuff. And then it's like, and you know what I do with my share? My share goes into kitty so I can lose my shirt in four more weeks when I do it again, (laughs) except for the burrito, the carne asada burrito I'm going to buy at Rancheritos on my way home. (laughs) And, And the thing is, I'm happy to do all that because I have, financial security in other areas right but at the end of the day you just as an artist you do have to deal with this you know thing of like oh, zip code defeat i may have just i may have just coined a phrase there it is zip code nemesis yeah yeah <laughs> yeah anyway. zip code paralysis or something <laughs> yeah <laughs> Z- zip code <laughs> I don't know, but it, but it is a real thing. And we all know that it is. And like, and you're in, and you're in Dallas, right? So Mm -hmm. it's like, you know, and here's the deal. So it's like, you know, I'd have to ask. So like when Dan Hurley plays, is there 1200 people there? Because like (laughs) there should be. Yeah. Because the man's a freaking legend. You know what I mean? And like what he's contributed, but everybody's like, Oh yeah, Dan's playing at the, you know, at a restaurant down there or whatever. Right. Yeah. And so you do, you know, you got it, but look, that's the thing some people's personalities might be such that it's like, man, I have devout followers in my zip code, but I can't pack a room in Ames, Iowa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas there's some of us that are like, yeah, I don't know why, but my neighbors don't ever really show up, you know, in the kind of numbers I'd like to see. Mm -hmm. But, you know, maybe it's because I'll be like, I'll just catch him next month. Right. But it's easier for me to pack a room someplace else. So let, let that, all that goes into this career development stuff where you look at it and you go, okay, I've got to figure out like, how am I going to make my bread? Am I a local guy? Am I a regional guy? Am I a national guy? Am I an international guy? Mm-hmm. And that's just the performing aspect of it. So right. you even tackled the other five umbrellas of education, composing, right. writing, industry, you know, right. retail, all of that, all of that stuff. Right. So real quick, you went back to your alma mater and now you're teaching there, right? Yeah, so right. A lot of musicians go into music and then they end up teaching and that's awesome. 
Um, some people don't like to do it. Some people love it. And I've talked a little bit about, you know, what it really means to teach. It's a lot more than people think it is. It's It can be incredibly difficult. It can be um, incredibly taxing on your ears and your creativity. And I mean, and I'm sure you can go, you know, into that even more. But for someone who is, you know, wanting to teach and, and people are out there now getting PhDs so that they can become right. a professor at a school. And I know that that landscape is changing what are your thoughts on music education, the value of it, and then also for those who want to teach? Yeah. Well, you know, if you don't love the students, there's no reason to teach, you know, that I can see, you know, yeah. because it's just going to be miserable. It's like I've said, I, I'm really lucky, man. My students, everyone, I, every one of them in my studio, tremendous respect, great work ethic. Like awesome. I don't have, I don't have one person, you know, right now. And I haven't for years, 10 years. I've, you know, maybe count on one hand, how many students I would say were challenging, mm -hmm. you know, maybe two fingers, mm -hmm. but, and I even got along with them. I love passing on the information. And if you don't love that, there's no reason because teaching, well, it's like this. I tell my students, I'm like, look, when you come prepared, teaching isn't a job, it's a joy. It's so fun to sit around and talk about music, you know, and like share and like, oh, yeah, but did you think about it this way? And I'm learning, too, because, man, the fact is, when you get to teaching the level I'm teaching, I have some smart students and they're solving some problems way faster than I than I have. So I I really get to benefit. I become a learner with yeah. some of these guys, you know, it's a teach and a learn environment. But if they don't practice, it's not a job either. It's hell. You know, I mean, it's like it's worse than a job. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, and, and I can put up with all the admin stuff and all the politics and that, because I love those students, you know, mm -hmm. and I, and I have a lot of respect for the students because they've decided to, to take a path that's very challenging and demanding and emotionally draining. And, um, and it forces you to confront a lot of fears that I think a lot of other professions, you know, maybe don't really address. Yeah. And so. So I'm in their corner. I'm rooting for them, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, you've made the same choices I've made, and this is, and guess what? This is hard, you know. I mean, yeah. this this is going to be tricky, and so, um, and so that makes it, you know, that makes it worth it for me. Now, as far as going to the school, I really do think that, like, the only reason to go to, and this is where I am. I might, I might change. What time is it? It's three thirty. I might change my mind by four o'clock. But, <laughs> but where I am right now is that. Like, you know, if you only want to play and you don't want to teach and you're truly not going to do anything ever again, then I'm not sure you should go to school. You should take that money. And some look at man, some of these schools are charging what forty five to sixty thousand oh, dollars yeah. a year. Oh yeah. Imagine this, Spencer. What if you were like, hey, I'm gonna go give sixty thousand dollars a year to and then insert your favorite jazz musician here and have them mentor me that'd be the best education you'd ever get yeah and you'd probably pay for a life like you could they could it'd be like hiring a personal chef they would just like live at your house you'd be like right for yeah. that much money i mean they're the, right. they're yours forever probably, yeah you know and then imagine and imagine this then you get three guys together like a, a you know i'm a guitar player say you get a bass player and a drummer and they're like and we'll give you sixty thousand to live with us too and be in our band yeah. And we're going to give, here's the thing, we're going to give Joe Lovano or somebody, like I said, insert favorite jazz musician here, 130 grand a year, at least maybe 180 grand a year to do this, to do this thing with us. And that's what you'd be paying at, at insert any of the top tier schools, right? Yeah. Who wouldn't take that gig? Yeah, right. We just, I we mean, just created the new model just now. Just now, right. I mean, like you pay to get mentored yeah. and it doesn't come with a piece of paper, but look, if you're not going to teach and you only want to play, that's how you learn to play. You play by being on the bandstand with people who destroy you every night. Yeah. Jeez. Now that I've said that. So to all your listeners, yes, for $60,000 a year, I'm available. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> See, we just we just created another income stream. But I mean honestly, like why wouldn't that work? Yeah. 
Exactly. But you have to have you have to have that piece of paper to teach, and it's important. Those pieces of papers are important. There is there are parts of academia that you know you only learn by being in academia. You know, yeah. and that's and that really is the you know the just the the honest honest truth. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. And um, and so it is it is important. And so I don't you know I don't um, I don't discredit the education that I got, and and. It, it is getting more and more. I have noticed this that that students that uh, students, people and you know players that have the PhD and the doctorate, really are high level players at this point. There are high level players that are going to get that education, and it, that wasn't always the case, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was, you know, people stayed in school sometimes or, or wanted a teaching gig because they weren't going to make it as players. Mm -hmm. But now the gigs have up you have great world-class players that are getting advanced degrees yeah and that's kind of awesome because what that's doing is it's making the academic scene uh much much stronger yeah that's definitely true. well said so before we wrap up i have to hear about this um in my pre-form survey i ask everybody to give me a crazy but true fact and yours was that you once helped capture a fleeing armed robber. I have to, I have to hear about this. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you know, first of all, um, you know, I should tell you, I'm, I'm not a uh, law enforcement agent. Um, <laughs> I probably can handle myself in, 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 in a myriad of situations. You know, I'm not a small guy and, uh, and I've, you know, I've, been on the mat with a lot of MMA guys. I trained very lightly for about 18 months on and off. I've, you know, I know mm -hmm. enough jujitsu to like show up and put a gi on and I've never built up, but I, I'm not good at all. But, um, but before all that happened in my life, I was on a, um, uh, like when I was in my twenties, I was on like a community slow pitch softball team. And, uh, this is awesome where this yeah. is starting. Yeah. And, um, and, and I, you know, I, I loved playing baseball and stuff growing up, but I'm not a great player anymore, but, but anyway, so I, you know, I was playing for, um, oh, some, uh, car dealership in town. I can't really remember, but they had sponsored a team and uh, like they needed a, you know, like another player. So yeah. I, was, I was playing, I have a decent arm. I think I was playing center field or something, sometimes yeah. second base, but, um, so anyway, we were at practice and all of a sudden like a block away, we see all these cars come in, like these cop cars. And they, they, they circle this house. And I mean, and they are coming out like guns drawn. Wow. And I'm like, awesome. And all, <laughs> like, like somebody's going down and somebody did something wrong. Yeah. And so anyway, so the hoopla kind of started to die down, but then we looked, I looked over and I was with this buddy of mine. And there was this extremely sh overweight shirtless dude in these bushes, like hiding in the bushes. And I was like, wow, what is going on? And like, and so we, and so I kind of walked over and we were like, Hey, are they looking for you? And he looked at us and he just started to run. So we're like, we're on it, man. <laughs> boom, 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 boom. We start to chase him through this neighborhood. And we did. We chased him through some backyards. And at one point, he threw his hand into his pocket. He was wearing cargo shorts. And he pulled his hand out. And I yelled, he's reaching in his shorts. He might have a gun. And so we dodged behind some cars. And then we saw that he had just grabbed a huge wad of money. And he threw it under this car in the driveway. <laughs> so we continued our pursuit. And as we got to him and got to the point where we could tackle him, an off-duty policeman came running from like perpend perpendicular, uh -huh. I guess, gun drawn and yelled, get on the ground. And of course, and kicked him in the stomach. And we were right there for the whole thing to tackle like, oh, man. like everything. Well, anyway, what had, what had happened was, and then he, and then he threw the cop threw his gun on us because he didn't know us. Right, right. Right. He thought we were running away too. Oh man. So anyway, we explained to him what was going on. Once he saw we were helping, then he was like, "Yeah, you know, help me hold the guy down." And and then I went back and grabbed all the money. And it turned out that these guys had like 
pistol whipped a guy in a quickie mart and robbed the, uh, 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 like they, they were, they were, had just barely like a couple hours before they had pulled off, uh, temporarily a, an armed robbery. And, um, wow. anyway, and I was there for the apprehension of one of two assailants. Wow. That's, <laughs> that's exciting. Um, so on that note, yeah. um, stay in school to, to, <laughs> to bring us back i just had to hear about that that's yeah that's awesome um so for our listeners if there's one piece of advice you would impart on them what would that be well it would it would be in whatever field you are and i mentioned this earlier it would be to um you know surround yourself with with people that are better at the thing that you're trying to get good at uh, you know whether that be you know your finances or entrepreneurship or or, or music, you know, like you, and, and don't be afraid to pay for that service, to, to pay to get better at that. You know, we have to invest. Musicians are horrible at investing in ourselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're real quick to, to be like do-it-yourselfers yeah. and, and uh, oh, I'll learn this on my own. But like it, you can really save a lot of time and a lot of pain if you just go out and, you know, hang with people, the right people and pay the right people. But then the other thing that I leave with everybody is, is this, if you can do these four things, you will be undeniable. You will be undeniably successful. And that is, you have to be good at what you do. You have to show up on time. You have to be a good hang and you have to wear the right threads. And if you do those four things, luck will be taken out of the equation with your career, right? Now, if you do three of those things, you probably do okay. I know people that are good at their craft, show up on time and wear the right threads, and they're, you know, maybe not the greatest hang, but they still have a decent career, Mm -hmm. right? Now, if we get down to two things, two of those four things, now it's not impossible for you to be successful, but luck is going to come into the game. Mm Mm-hmm. Let's say you're a great hang and you wear the right threads. Well, then you're going to have to be lucky, right? Yeah. If you are only one of those four things, it's going to be extremely lucky and probably not plausible or bankable that you're going to have a successful career in anything. But if you can do all four, it's going to be pretty hard to deny you. Yeah, I agree. Very well said. How can our listeners learn more about you and or get in touch with you? Uh, the best way is my website, CoreyChristiansen.com, C-O-R-E-Y-C-H-R-I-S-T-I-A-N-S-E-N.com. I'm, uh, I'm not really good at updating the website. I do, I do quite a bit on social media these days. Mm-hmm. That's a great place to get a hold of me. Um, my musician page, uh, my f- regular friends page or whatever is full. Um, on Facebook, but I have a musician page. Um, you know, my Instagram account, uh, which is um, um, Corey, C O R E Y underscore guitar. Those are great places. You know, uh, messaging, I, I usually get to everybody's messages. Um, you know, I might not always be the fastest re- response because I am juggling a lot of chainsaws, <laughs> you know, every, every day, every week. I mean, I'm available for like, you know, mentoring sessions and, and stuff like that. So awesome. Wonderful. Yeah. And thanks, Spencer, for having me on. This is a great thing you're doing. Musicians really need, they need this information that you're putting out there for them. Thank you. I will put everything that you mentioned in the show notes. And actually, you know, I've been meaning to ask people this at the end. Do you have a, a book recommendation or books that you want to recommend? Man, I should have more. I don't read that many books, to be honest. Um, most of my stuff is is learned by surrounding myself with people that should be writing the books or or yeah. have written the books. Yeah, you know? that works. And so that that's what I would recommend is find people that are experts. And books are great. Man, there's something about being around somebody. It's like learning music, right? I mean, like learning a music on how to play some bebop is great. That's a great book if you find one you like but it's pretty cool to go study with somebody and have them say, Hey kid, put your finger here. Yeah. You're kind of touching on the cone of learning and you right. know, at the top of the cone is actually doing it. Right. And you know, towards the bottom is books. Right. 
Not that yeah. that's not a great way to learn, but it you can know, be. They're very there's a range. Yes. Yeah. 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 Wonderful. So yeah. I hope that this interview was valuable to those of you listening. If you enjoyed the podcast, feel free to share with a musician who could use these resources and wants to learn more about financial literacy and or leave a review on iTunes. And I hope you all have a great day. Keep thriving. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of financial and creative freedom? Check out the leading financial blog for musicians at spencerlist.com, where Spencer covers the latest trends and financial strategies. And by signing up for the Thriving Musician newsletter, you can earn exclusive member content and discounts. Get it all at www.spencerlist.com. If you would like to nominate a thriving musician for an interview on the podcast, request Spencer to speak at your school or event, or want to submit questions or comments, please send an email to spencer at spencerlist.com and keep thriving.